The community itself we're very attached to. It's an active community. And so many people volunteer for community events, participate in community events. It's a big part of why we choose to stay. We totally fell in love with this place. It was wild. I felt at home here immediately and we still love it. The Herat Proctor Community Forest started as an attempt by the local residents, which ended up being a successful attempt to gain control over managing their own watersheds. When we heard that logging was going to take place in the western side of the community, we started to pay attention and so ended up with a blockade in Harrop. The solution that we ended up with was allowing some logging to take place, but protecting the watersheds. People who were very engaged all along formed the board. The board really had wide representation from the community. They were determined that we would maintain our rural lifestyle, our drinking water, create employment, and be inclusive, and to make sure that forestry operations never strayed from their original intention of protecting water. There were no wildfires when we came here first in the 80s and 90s. That was a new thing to us. When we had a fire in 2003, we had a meeting at the Proctor Hall every night to discuss how we are going to get out of here. The danger of the fire brought the community together in a really wonderful way. There was this hot, dry wind from the west. The fire was just behind this hill, right behind us, and the glow was incredible, and there was ash dropping everywhere around us. At two in the morning, we were standing out here, thinking, this is it. We said goodbye to the house. We were seeing the flames coming, and we smelled rain, and we just looked at each other. We were holding hands, and we were very emotional. We heard people in the neighborhood screaming of joy, and we didn't leave. We didn't have to leave. The 2003 wildfire was a turning point for the community forest. It was definitely a, a wake-up call for the community to see wildfire as a threat that could touch us. That had a lasting impression. For me, as the general manager of the community forest, feeling so unprepared for an event like that was pretty sobering. As community forest managers, it suddenly became very real to us that we could lose the community forest and that our community could be greatly impacted. After that, forest practices really took a look at how we could mitigate interface fuel. We need to be integrating fuel management and wildfire risk reduction into our entire forest management paradigm. We need to shift our thinking in a way that allows for certain of our areas to not be as dense coniferous forests as we might want just for a timber purpose. The more resilient forest, the more fire adapted forest is actually one that is managed for multiple different values, which can include the timber and the wildlife and also wildfire. Fuel mitigation is very similar to firefighting, but without the fire. We're still creating the fuel-free zones, trying to burn the excess fuel to get rid of it before the fire has a chance. Fuel mitigation and work is great because it allows us to actually do some preventative work ahead of the fire instead of all reactionary work. Some of the misconceptions are that we're just coming in here logging, and that's like the furthest thing from the truth. As you see, we, have, we leave all the nicest trees. What we're trying to do is space them out and allow them to take a bit of a fire. Like if a ground fire came through here, this stand would be protected quite easily. When I first started, we did a lot of prescribed burning. Now, over the years, we've changed to this fuel mitigation, which allows us to get closer to communities. We're actually removing the fuel closest to communities and access roads for people to evacuate in case there is a fire. It's important to look at the entire interface between the forest and our communities. So that area where the community butts up right against the forest or the forest is intermixed with the community, we need to be looking at the entirety of the fuels in that band. And it's important also to connect up our treatments so that we have a continuous break to manage. So if there's a community that has an established fuel break, the likelihood of that community also 
having approached FireSmart around their houses, is aware and understands the fire ecosystem that they live in, that's the biggest difference. All of these individual treatments that we're doing on the landscape are part of a larger plan. And over the next five to 10 years, they will all be connected up so that we have a continuous fuel break in behind the community and a few landscape level fuel breaks as well. So when the next wildfire comes, we will be in a much better position to protect the community and to reduce the negative impacts of a large wildfire. Fighting fire adjacent to a community adds another dimension to a job that's already stressful. Everything that you do in that moment matters. I've witnessed climate change over the 15 years that I've been on the ground as a firefighter. I've noticed hotter, drier summers, higher fire activity than I've seen in the past. Fires that would typically be contained within 24 hours are now borderline inactionable because of how severe they're burning and how inaccessible they become. Of course, there's a huge link between climate change and wildfire. And we know a bunch of things. We know that the climate is warming significantly. We know that extreme events are increasing in frequency. We know that in certain seasons we are drying. We're getting periods of extended drought. All of those things have implications for the forest and they all mean that the forest will burn more frequently with higher severity. And that is gonna have absolutely profound implications to the forest of BC. Climate change adaptation and wildfire risk reduction in our ecosystems here are highly compatible. In fact, they need to be woven together, such that when we do the kinds of treatments we do to reduce wildfire risk, we're also adapting to the changing climate. I'm seeing a change in the way we're managing fires on the landscape now. More and more, we're allowing fires to burn within areas where there are no values at risk and that benefits the ecosystem. It benefits future wildfires in terms of not having that fuel build up. Taking a more of a modified response to suppression is a healthier, holistic way of looking at fire management and forest management. We need to really start to look at the forest in terms of its values. We need to think about what we are trying to maintain and what we need to maintain. We need to maintain carbon. We need to maintain forest resilience. And that means maintaining biodiversity, means maintaining wildlife trees. It means maintaining the diversity of underground linkages between trees that actually keep the forest resilient. All of those things, we need to put them first. A lot of these things are compatible and we need to manage well for them and then we can maintain this huge diversity of values in the forest and reduce wildfire risk overall. We see how much fire is returning to our landscape and we see the climate changing. The management of the community forest shifts with the times and with our understanding of how dynamic the ecosystem is. We've also been managing this land for over 20 years now, and we see how it's changed in front of our eyes. The community is demanding us to take wildfire risk reduction into consideration in all of our work, as well as climate change adaptation. Since the wildfire mitigation work began, that's changed everything. It's the step that the community forest took that gave us the security we now feel. It's not left to chance anymore. It's really reducing the chance that the worst could happen. And it makes us feel at home and at ease.